Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today's guest is my go-to person whenever there's a question about processed food addiction. If you watch this year's The Truth About Weight Loss Summit, you may remember her. She was the kickoff speaker. Now that's significant because if you've ever seen a Broadway show, they always put their best numbers, the opening and the closing number. And she really set the stage for what we were talking about where weight loss and food addiction intersect. And it's worse than you think. You know, there's a saying that when somebody is knowledgeable, you'll say, oh, well, they wrote the book on such and such. Well, she really did <laughs> write the book on food addiction. Her book, which you can see over her shoulder, is called Process Food Addiction. And I'm so excited to finally have her on the show. Please welcome Dr. Joan Iflin. Thank you so much, Chef AJ. I appreciate you deeply. Yeah, show the book, please. because I. Oh, okay. So this is a textbook, actually. It's CRC Press. It's 240,000 words on. It's a big book, 2,000 citations. This is why we know what we know. It's because you take all these little findings, some of them not so little, in obesity and eating disorders and drug addiction, and you piece them all together and you get the picture. But it takes, it took me three years to write this. I don't know, I looked at six or 8,000 studies. Uh, the textbook is built from 2,000 studies so that you know that you're getting uh, validated answers. It's not just somebody's whimsical, oh, I think it must be this way because it was this way for me. No, it's just you get real answers when you go to the research. Yeah, exactly. And what, what floors me, Dr. Iflin, is that even with all the citations and with your book, and I wish your book was something I could afford to literally give to every practitioner, because so many, even medical doctors, just discount the notion that food, you know, I understand food can't be addictive, but processed food isn't food. Yeah, I, I, have to, I have to tell you, I will not name names, but I was talking to a practitioner and she, she took the book like this and she said, I would just like to hit them over the head with it, like this. Ah, <laughs> so funny. That is fantastic. Well, so today we're actually gonna talk about a, a, a part of food addiction because we already know it is addictive. You have done so many interviews with me and other wonderful podcasters about the why, but we're really gonna address the fact of the role that the food industry played in the obesity epidemic. And the reason this interview came about is sort of a nice story. I was contacted by a high school senior and I got this email. I have to do a big research project on an injustice in the United States. I love that she considers this an injustice. It is. Yeah, it absolutely is. She says, I have listened and watched you speak in videos and I thought you'd be an expert on the topic. Would I be able to interview you? You're a big role model of mine. And I said, yes, you will be able to interview me. I said, but this is a very important topic and I'm really not an expert. Let me go to the expert, interview her and you can use that for your project. And she was so excited. She's sorry she can't hey. be. She has hey. track right at this time. She saw from, uh, from Omaha, but I was so excited to do this. And so let's dive right in to the topic. Does the food industry play a role in America's East obesity? The epidemic using the questions of the high school senior doing the food research project, the research project. Yeah. So the first question she asks is, what role, if any, does the food industry play in America's obesity epidemic? So uh, I just want to remind your listeners that I have my PhD in addictive nutrition, but my undergraduate degree is in economics and political science from Oberlin. I worked for the Wisconsin legislature on fiscal issues out of college, and then I went to business school. I went to Stanford Business School, and I worked for a Fortune 200 company for five years. My father was a biochemist at a consumer goods corporation, so I grew up in a corporation. And really, without those experiences, I wouldn't be able to, to talk about processed food addiction. So that first question, what role, if any, does the food industry play in America's obesity epidemic? Uh, I would say that the food industry created the obesity epidemic. Yes, uh, they have an addiction business model. This all started when tobacco companies bought processed food companies. So in 1963, a tobacco company bought Hawaiian Punch. 
and transferred tobacco marketing practices to sugar for children. And then in, 19, in 1980, uh, I think it was Monsanto. No, it was, an, it was a Japanese company, Mitsubishi, who invented high fructose corn syrup. And that was a cheap sweetener. And by 1985, in two years, the tobacco industry bought Kraft, 80% of Nabisco, and General Foods. So they very quickly had control over 10% of American spending on food. And what did they do? They applied the addiction business model. This is the model they perfected for tobacco. They just slid it right over to processed foods. It's very, very heavy advertising to very young aged children with uh, very addictive properties to the product, making it very available and very affordable. The five A's of the addiction business model. So yes, they, you know, cre they created it. I love that because, you know, think about it. We didn't even have an obesity epidemic or obesity before processed food existed. Well, and so this is what's so, the, the, the evidence is so powerful for this. Before tobacco bought those big three food manufacturers, we had an obesity and overweight rate of about 45%. So it was already pretty high. We had sugar, we had processed foods. I can remember as a child, uh, seeing the processed food advertisements on the cartoon commercials. But within 20 years, which is just the blink of an eye, that rate went to over 70%. And you have that acquisition, you have the, the tobacco industry coming in right at the beginning of that. And you know, what's even more diabolical is they, the tobacco industry bought the processed food industry who are not, who's now buying like Weight Watchers. <laughs> so they give us the disease and then they give us the cure, which really isn't going to work. I, I, I no. think it's so diabolical. They are, they are ruthless. They are merciless. I love the framing of this as a social injustice because we, we weren't given any chance like nobody ever called up and said, would you like to sign up to be food addicted, processed food addicted? And not only obesity, but Nancy Appleton keeps a list on her website of the studies connecting processed foods to diseases. I think she's up to 141. Mental, emotional, physical, behavioral disorders, one after another. And I know from my experience of 25 years of watching people get off these processed foods, and now especially that we have a support community for them, all this stuff just clears up. Yeah. It and just clears up. It's like in their marketing, they're so shrewd because it's bad enough that they have processed food for the general public, but now there's vegan processed food and keto processed food and paleo processed food. It doesn't matter what adjective they put before it, it's still crap. Uh, uh, yes. they. Once you process a plant, it is no longer food. You've concentrated the endorphins, natural endorphins in plants. So it's pleasant to eat. It's a nice thing that mother nature did for us. Make it pleasant. You get a little endorphin release when you eat. You don't just survive. But the food industry so concentrated those endorphins that now those plants are addictive. And, and that's what, it, you know, really, I mean, I thank you so much for your first book because Sugars and Flowers, how they make us crazy, sick and fat. I mean, you really are like the pioneer in this because oh. most people know that, that, well, let's put it this way. A lot of people still probably won't believe this because people don't want to hear the truth. But most people know sugar is not a health food, whether they eat it a lot or yeah. don't eat it at yeah. all. But yeah. you try to take bread or pasta or flour away from people and they flip out. Bread is the staff of life. We break bread with our loved ones. Yeah. And you're the one that showed that, that for those, and it might not be the entire population, but for those of us that are sensitive or vulnerable to the effects of the refining of a plant, it's more of a drug than a food. Yeah, and people do struggle with that idea. Look, it's in the Bible. They eat bread in the Bible, not what we're eating today. So if you ate bread in the Bible, it's because uh, somebody took a grinding stone and broke up grain 
until it was small enough that it could be soaked and stuck together and then heated, uh, cooked on a stone. Well, those are chunks. It's not a powder. And believe me, they did not go to the effort to take out the fiber. So that was just, that was like a broken up whole grain. Very, very different from the powder that our bread is made from today. Absolutely. We're not supposed to eat powders, whether it's cocaine or sugar or flour, in my opinion. <laughs> the only right. thing white we should be eating is jicama and cauliflower. Right, exactly. Yep, great. So next question from our high school senior is, do you think the food industry should be responsible for promoting health? Yeah, so this is like asking, do you think the tobacco industry should be responsible for promoting health? It's or like, do you think that a cocaine dealer should be uh, responsible for promoting health? These are addiction merchants. Should an opiate dealer be responsible for promoting health? Well, you what you're really asking is, should they go out of business? Now, that's the only way that you can promote health for somebody who's addicted to a, a destructive substance. So it's a it's a really clever question. But it's it's totally unrealistic. No, you cannot you cannot expect a, a, a an addiction merchant to educate their customers on how to not use the substances, which is how you promote health. Yeah, you know it's funny because not only don't they educate us, but then they blame us when they get the disease. You know, oh my god! Like, like if, you, know, you know, as if we should. You know, well, you know, you should have had more willpower. You should have been able to moderate your use. And yeah. you know, and I think back to when my well, mostly sugar addiction. I didn't have quite as much problem with the flour. But I mean, the first time I had a Coke Slurpee with eight pumps of vanilla syrup, I had. I mean, I was hooked. Literally, I had it every day for the rest of my life until I quit when I was over forty three years old. I mean, that's. Yeah. I, I could not not have it. That's how fast it happened. Yes, um, we do have some good research showing that it only takes five to seven days of a 30% sugar solution to activate addiction in a, a laboratory animal's brain. These substances are not just addictive, they're highly addictive. We just have um, a new book out saying that uh, when sugar touch, touches a taste bud, it's about half a second for the brain to react. When fat touches the roof of the mouth, about half a second for the brain to react versus most drug reactions, which take like 10 minutes. So this, these are highly addictive substances. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah. Our yeah. next question from our high school senior, is it logical to assume that the food industry values profit over the health of its consumers? Yeah, not just logical, but uh, essential. Uh, we have Wall Street. We have investors and uh, the stock price is dependent on earnings. And everybody, if you think that these managers actually have some kind of independence, they don't. Uh, they are doing calls with their investors regularly and justifying their actions in terms of profit creation. So they're, uh, they're it's just like the tobacco industry. You know, once you get investors, then you're stuck. You have to do whatever bad thing you're doing that makes money. You have to continue to do it or your, your company will go out of business and your employees will lose their jobs. And it doesn't justify uh, making, you know, giving hundreds of millions of people a shorter and miserable life. But um, yeah, this is, this is just how American capitalism runs. You know, um, on the summit that you were part of, we had Dr. Eric Walsh, who also did talk a lot about food addiction, especially when it came to racial disparity. And he has a phrase that the business of business is business. And yeah. I understand that, but like how, knowing what they, like it's one thing, like if you have something, you didn't know it was dangerous. You know, like I'm sure that when, when smoking started, they maybe they knew, but it, it maybe they didn't know. And if they didn't know, then, you know, okay, well now they know, so let's stop selling cigarettes, you know, rather than just putting labels on them and, and things like that, or taking the advertisement off. But when you, when you look at like the work of Michael Moss or read his book, he has a new one. He was recently on the show talking about hooked is that the people that create these addictive pr products won't even consume them themselves. They won't like the guy that invented Lunchables. It doesn't let his kids have it. No, How does gosh, he no. Every day and sell them and make other 
kids fat and diabetic. I, it just, I don't understand. I understand everybody has to work. Just, you know, it's the same thing with slaughterhouses. It's like, I know people have to have jobs, but I, I just don't get how these executives who are making, you know, millions and millions of dollars, how do they sleep at night knowing I don't know. how many people they're hurting? Well, the one, the one answer I've thought about over the years is denial. So uh, there's an incredible quote from a tobacco executive, uh, which is something like, it's probably out of the cigarette papers book. Uh, I would rather have a shorter life with the pleasure of a cigarette than a longer life without. That is an addict. That is a person who is addicted. That is a person whose brain is being their thoughts, their judgments, their values, their rationalizations are being controlled by addicted brain cells in their reward system. So they're, they're sick, they're mentally ill. Yeah, I've had people, you know, cause we both promote eating whole foods, not packaged, yeah. foods, not processed foods. And I've had people say to me, you know, I would rather die than eat vegetables. And I'm like, well, you, you will. will. <laughs> yeah, that's a wish, that's a fulfilled wish that's in your future. Yeah, absolutely. I know, I know, it's so hard when everybody is addicted and they're all saying the same things, you normalize addiction. Like I, I have it. I, I was just visiting um, family members and separate. I, I brought it home. It's a package of, of, uh, of very addictive food. And on the middle, in the back of it, it says severely addictive. Like they're just, they're not just flaunting it they're celebrating the addictive nature of their products. It's if they're normalizing addiction is what they're doing because they know the addiction issue is coming. And so there's, they're normal. They're trying to normalize it. Like it's normal to have an addiction. No, it's not. <laughs> well, they even put it in the advertising. Bet you can't eat just, eat just one. one. Once and, you pop, you just can't stop. Yes. Or um, a water. It was a water. The, the character on the screen is saying, uh, I could stop if I wanted to. <laughs> like, so they're really trying to blur the line between an addiction and something that's, uh, well, yes, we do need water, but we don't need bottled water and we don't need fluids that have a lot of other junk in them. You know, it's interesting because the people that say that, you know, because I've had family members that have died from, you know, I say food addiction, the death certificate may have said coronary artery disease, diabetes, pancreatic cancer, but they were all morbidly obese. And why were they morbidly obese? Because of what they ate. And I remember my brother who was a medical doctor saying, you know, I, you know, I just, I, I know you're right. I just can't do it. But the people that say they would rather die than eat the way that we eat in a whole natural way that our ancestors ate throughout most of human history. They just don't know how good they could feel. As good as they feel with the addiction, see, they don't know how we feel and how abstinence is bliss and how we love the food we eat. We love the way we look. We love the way we feel. And we didn't when we were on sugar and flour. No, no, this is incredibly hard to explain to somebody because this is an addiction that starts in early childhood, even, even at birth. Nobody's ever had the pleasure of a clear head. Nobody's ever had the pleasure of being able to stay calm for most of a day or even an entire day. It just, it's impossible to describe to somebody who's never experienced it. Yeah, absolutely. Here's a, an interesting question. How has the food industry changed over your lifetime? Okay, so this is, I think, a fantastic question. I was born in 1951. So I grew up in the 50s and there was already cartoon commercials for processed foods, because I can remember them clearly, those commercials. Uh, the cereals that those commercials were promoting were in our house. And there was a cereal during that time that was 70% sugar. So the, the food industry was at it uh, long before the cigarette companies came in. But when the cigarette companies came in, they just hyper activated everything. You know, they hired that consultant Howard Moskowitz to ramp up the sugar, fat, salt in all their products. So the big, big difference is that now processed foods are saturated with sugar, fat, salt, and the sugar is high fructose corn syrup, which we have some very good evidence uh, 
creates disease differently than sugar. So fatty liver, for example, is you can make fatty liver go away by taking the, taking the high fructose corn syrup out of the diet. And Robert Lustig has demonstrated this in a brilliant experiment in, in brilliant research in, at UC, at University of California, San Francisco. So that is, you've got those two product formulation factors that um, are just stunning. And it's just like when the tobacco industry extracted and concentrated nicotine and then put it into cigarettes. It's stunning. It's product formulation that makes the product highly addictive. So that is one big change. The other big change is the advertising. So even in uh, even before the tobacco industry came in, there were an average like 165. One Saturday morning, cartoon commercials for processed foods. But within seven years, it was like 565. So you had this incredible ramping up of addictive advertising. And that's so crucial because that is how you train brain cells to become addicted. You associate cues or messages with the, uh, an addictive substance. So once that child has eaten that fast food or the breakfast cereal or the cracker or the Lunchable, they, and they've had the addictive response, they, they will get that addictive response from an associated cue. So all just seeing a picture of it will create that same release of controlling. It's so much, one researcher called it a flood. So the brain is now flooded with these craving neurotransmitters and they control behavior. You think you're controlling behavior in your frontal lobe? Oh, I know better. No, absolutely not. Frontal lobe is only 2% of the brain. The other 98% of the brain totally overwhelms the frontal lobe. And you have that robot feeling, I don't wanna go get this, but I'm getting it. I'm walking, my frontal lobe is screaming, don't get it. But the other 98% of the brain has control of behavior and you feel like a remote controlled robot, you're going to get it. That's what has happened. Dr. Ifland, I hear Howard Moskowitz being talked about a lot. Is the gentleman still alive? Oh my goodness. Talk about brazen. He's got a friggin' web website. You can hire him today to make your products addictive. I was asked to be on a summit and they showed me who else was speaking on the summit. Howard Moskowitz was on the summit talking about how to create sugar addiction. I said, I cannot be on your summit. Thank you very much. I cannot be on the same panel with this monster. Well, maybe like, debate him. Maybe I could have you both on and you can debate him. I wonder if he would do something like that. Oh gosh, do you know he's worth $45 million? Yeah, he just, he just brought it in from those corporations. And Michael Moss interviews him. This is how I know about him in Michael Moss's book, Sugar, Fat, Salt. And Michael Moss gets to know him. I mean, Michael must be really good at this. And then they're having lunch and he said, but, but how could you do this? He said, well, I had to feed my family. 45 million feeds a lot of families. <laughs> and, and it killed hundreds of millions of other families. Yeah. Yeah. Oh boy. Don't get me started. Yeah. Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But then here, look at this next question. How do you think politics plays into the perpetuation of American obesity? I don't know if you know Marion Nessel. I've interviewed her. Oh my her. gosh. Here's her book. Oh no, no. Here's her book. Food politics. Oh yeah. Um, Marion. Oh gosh. We just should all get down on our knees and be thankful for Marion. Um, and the other one is Nina Titolt, the Big Fat Lie book. So they're both really into the politics. All you have to do to understand politics is uh, go to the tobacco experience. So in 1964, the Surgeon General did the work, came conclusively tobacco causes cancer, made the announcement. 45 years later, Congress passes the Family Anti-Smoking Act. 
why in the world did it take 45 years? Well, because there were eight senators from four tobacco states. And there's this thing in Congress called log rolling. And this is why you have to have the, po the politics in your background somewhere to get what's really going on. And the eight senators just all banded together and they said, if you want us to vote for anything that you are doing, you are, we, we just have one small requirement that you vote against any anti-tobacco legislation. Believe it or not, the government used to subsidize tobacco farmers. So they were able to hold off a legislation for 45 years. Millions more people being coming addicted and suffering really, really horribly from smoking. But these eight senators were able to hold that off for eight years. And uh, remarkably, when uh, the US, you know, through the court system, finally started dampening the tobacco industry in the US, the State Department of the US government helped the tobacco industry uh, oppress other governments. So like Thailand was able to kind of fend off the tobacco industry for years. And then the state, the US State Department got involved, military aid, humanitarian aid. The, the State Department said, no, you will let these, the, the tobacco industry into your country. And within a year or two, it was very fast, 30% of Taiwanese teenagers were smoking. Not Taiwanese, Thai, Thai teenagers were smoking. So you have the complicity of the State Department there too. But this is also explains another thing that is otherwise mysterious, which is how did obesity spread around the world so fast? Well, it's because the tobacco industry had two relationships. They had relationships with the corner stores where they were selling the cigarettes and so they were able to just bing, 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 call up those stores. Hey, we got some new products for you and send them the processed food. So they immediately had availability and then they had the advertising contracts. So advertising contracts work by volume. The more advertising you do, each little additional segment of advertising becomes less expensive. So because they already had the tobacco advertising they were able to just put the processed food advertising on top of that at very, very uh, cheap prices. So they were able to do a lot of advertising. They had the ramped up addictive properties in the products. They got the advertising and they got the availability down so fast. You know, obesity spread around the world in 20 years. It's the blink of an eyelash. So yeah, it's, we're not gonna get help on this one because of course, every state in the United States produces wheat and corn or sugar or dairy. And you're not going to ever be able to get a Senator to say, hmm, yeah, I don't mind putting my farmers out of work. That's not gonna happen. So we're on our own, but thanks to people like you, Chef AJ, you're getting the word out. People are getting smarter and smarter about this. And now we, and you and I both have communities where people can get the level of support that you need for a severe addiction. It's just, you know, all the unhealthy crops are subsidized. There's, you know, they, there's no, you ever see a commercial on television for broccoli? I haven't. No, no, no. It's, uh, there's also the business, the, the government practices are subsidization. And then, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's what I just love that we're doing this under the umbrella of, of social injustice. And I, I, I when, when she told me that, I said, boy, now I love you even more. Yeah. So the next yeah. question from her is, in your experience, how does American culture impact our eating habits? So here's the sad thing is when we have, uh, the most powerful part of the brain is mirror neurons, conformance drive, because for 7 million years, if you were conforming to a tribe, seven to 12 people, uh, you would live and your children would live. And if you were a non-conformer, if you were the person who wandered off, well, the giant hyenas were waiting to have you for lunch and they did. And you wouldn't procreate, your children would not uh, live long enough to procreate. 
So we are deeply hardwired to conform. Wow. And now we're, and now we're surrounded by addicted people. We just had new research in 2020 on social circles. And what the guy was able to, I don't know if it's a guy or a woman, but um, he was able to show that if you're in a social circle that's gaining weight, you don't have a choice. You will be gaining weight because for those 7 million years, the thing that you copied the most was eating. If your tribe was eating, you were eating. If your tribe wasn't eating, then you would go with them to look for food. But you just, it, in, and it's so clear in the research today on mirror neurons, food, if it has something to do with food, you get much more activity in your mirror neuron system, which is all throughout your brain. So this culture, you cannot lose weight unless your social circle is losing weight. Uh, you will gain weight if your social circle is gaining weight, unless you come into an alternative social circle like the social circles that Chef AJ maintains or we maintain, it's, it's impossible. I just want everybody to know that you are fresh. I know many people out there are frustrated because they cannot lose weight. It is your mirror neurons who are conforming to the people around you. And it's pretty miraculous. Once you get into a different social circle, you can still party with those people, you know, play with those people and love them. But for, for food decisions, your mirror neurons have to have an alternative community. Yeah, well, that's a big deal. Environment's important. Do you think obesity is handled effectively by the majority of America's healthcare workers? Oh, these poor people do not have a clue. They don't have a clue. They've been trained in infections and accidents primarily. And they might have done a brief rotation in their medical training in addictions, but of course it's drug addiction and alcoholism. It's not a processed food addiction. So we're actually, um, it'll probably be either at the end of this year or next year, we'll start a recovery community specifically for health professionals because they are also traumatized. Uh, my daughter is an MD and they're, they're trained to think that they can fix things. And they spent, like my daughter spent 10 years and probably three quarters of a million dollars in foregone income to get her MD. And she, she, she didn't have the right training to help people. So they are just as traumatized as we are and no, they cannot help. Bariatric surgery has proven, has been shown not to work. It might take 10 years for the weight to come back or it might never come off in the first place. Um, no, uh, the, the, the health industry is, I hate saying this, uh, but uh, it's not the place to go. <laughs> Thank you. People are asking if you did a TED talk. I don't believe so, but you should. Anybody who knows how to get me a TED talk, please private message me on Facebook. I'm the Joan F. Land in Houston, even though I live in Seattle. Great, thank you. So what do you believe is the best solution to obesity and why? So it's doing what you're doing right now, which is controlling the messaging that reaches the 98% of the brain that's still working on a very simple principle. Take in the messaging, store it, and then act on it. So right now you're taking in messaging of uh, no, these are addictive and they're destructive and Chef AJ doesn't eat them and Joan Ifland doesn't eat them. Uh, so right now your brain is deciding whether Chef AJ and Joan might be, a new, might be a new social circle. Is this possible? Should we be doing what they're doing? But when you immerse yourself in the kind of programming that we are creating right now, very knowledgeable about addictions, very knowledgeable about the messaging that, that creates and triggers addiction. Uh, you are changing the programming in the 98% of the primitive brain. This is the beginning and the middle and the end. You've got to get clean messaging surrounding that primitive brain. Wow. Yeah. Here is 
a fun question. Why do some people become obese eating the standard American diet while others don't? I'm pretty sure genetics plays some role because some yes. people eat crap and be thin, like my husband, who doesn't eat crap, by the way, but if he Thank did. <laughs> well, um, this is another point that we, we actually know from the diabetic community. 20% of diabetics are not overweight. But why? It's because their bodies accumulate the fat around their organs instead of under their skin. And this is quite tragic. I was just talking recently to somebody who is, you know, has that, that particular slender body shape. And she said, it's a nightmare because nobody believes me. They just look at me and they say, oh, you're okay. I'm not okay when I'm up in the middle of the night binging on sugar. No, I'm not okay. And the other thing is, of course, we have an epidemic of bulimia. So people are able to, well, it's, I mean, it's, it's an incredibly destructive thing, but they, they take in the addictive substances and then they throw them up. So they're not accumulating the calories, but they are killing themselves. Uh, they're ruining the uh, gut function and the esophagus and all the rest of that stuff. So that's very hard. Uh, there's exercise bulimia. I remember sitting next to a person who said, well, I train, she was British. They, they don't exercise, they train. And she said, well, I train all the time so that I can eat what I want. I know it's like if you said, I train all the time so that I can snort as much cocaine as I want. No, it doesn't help, it's an addiction. Walking will help with cravings. We do have research on that, but uh, exercise bulimia also can keep an addicted person from developing the, the fat deposits. But yeah, and the sad thing about this addiction is that the food industry and the health industry have made it about fat tissue. Well, as we were just saying, there are 141 devastating diseases associated with processed foods. And I know, you know, after I've, when somebody's gotten off the processed foods, like maybe for three weeks, um, they're talking about mental clarity. They're talking about being able to stay calm. They're so excited because they can remember what they came into that room to get. You know, it's, it, it, what's really exciting when you get off the processed foods is the mental clarity your brain starts working again. And people will, they, you know, they, we, in our recovery communities, we don't talk about body shape because we want to make it, we want people to focus on the mental, emotional and physical behavioral benefits that they're getting. And because as we know, obviously gaining weight is not enough of a deterrent to eating this stuff. It's a very powerful addiction and body shape is not going to be a deterrent for that. But uh, I, you know, I'm going to scream at my kids, or um, I'm going to be asleep for a couple of days. Those are pretty good deterrents. Absolutely. Uh, please explain how food marketing influences obesity. So it is this, oh, this is just mind blowing. Tobacco, the tobacco companies were required to deposit 40,000 internal documents with the University of California, San Francisco as part of their settlements with the courts. So those researchers at UCSF are going through those documents. Two years ago, they published a study that was shocking. I and mean, it's amazing to still be able to be shocked. And the study showed that it was an internal document when R.J. Reynolds in 1963 bought Hawaiian Punch. Hawaiian Punch was an adult alcohol mixer and they repositioned it to be a sugary drink for children. They deliberately, it's described in this internal document, they deliberately described how they were going to translate tobacco marketing to sugar for children. And they used a devastating technique called surround marketing, surround marketing. So that first you would have the product a couple of times and it would, so you would start to sensitize this reward system. And once you've gotten that piece, 
that the reward system associates this particular substance, you don't actually have to have the substance. You can have a cue, a reminder, a trigger, a message, a, some kind of stimulation about the product reaching those primitive reward systems and the reward system will erupt into cravings. So uh, you, they took this warehouse concept from tobacco where you, if you smoked Marlboros, you could get a Marlboro lighter, you could get a Marlboro pen, you could get a Marlboro jacket. You could, you could surround yourself with reminders. Well, they took that concept to the uh, Hawaiian Punch warehouse where you could get a toy uh, phone with Punchy, their character with Punchy, or uh, all kinds of toys with Punchy, with the Punchy logo. The fast food industries picked that up totally and they, they send out toys with their fast food meals. So surround marketing just means that you are literally being driven crazy. Your brain is full of these craving neurotransmitters all the time. And that is why, that's why immersion recovery is essential. You're not just blocking out that surround marketing from the food industry, but you are also um, changing the messaging that reaches that primitive brain to positive, I am powerful, I am strong, I resist easily, uh, that food makes me sick, that food is the path to pain. You're teaching that other 98% of the brain how to react. So that when you see processed foods, instead of saying, mm, yummy, you say, oh, that'll make me so sick. But that is conditioning, that is Pavlovian conditioning of brain cells. Wow, thank you. What are your recommendations for others wanting to navigate the food industry safely? So uh, get out of get out of their reach. Uh, turn uh, just start this nice slow process of becoming aware of where you are being triggered. Where is processed food industry messaging reaching that primitive brain, the other ninety eight percent of the brain? Okay, it's everywhere and you just slowly dial it back. Uh, you begin to realize that the stressful programming on television is triggering the addiction. So you put a, <laughs> you put a, you put a towel over the television. You realize that you're driving down a main avenue where all the, uh, the food outlets are, go over a block or two and drive down a residential street to get home. I remember I was doing my doctoral internship at a small faith organization in South Houston. The first time I drove there, I got off at an exit. I passed 21 fast food outlets at that exit. So I said, I, I, by, by the time I had driven past it twice, there was one fast food outlet where I could literally taste, I could taste the product in my mouth. I just got off an exit earlier. And I drove the back, back roads to this church. Just avoid, avoid, avoid. Go through the, your children's toys and get the, the toys that have some kind of food logo out, out, out. Uh, I mean, magazines are full of ads for processed foods. Don't let them in your house and don't pick them up when you're sitting in the doctor's office. You'll become aware, where, where do I see this? Clear out your house. That is the single most calming thing that we can do. Clear it out. Maybe you can't throw it away because there are people in your house that are gonna go berserk, but put it in some kind of container and get it out into the garage. Availability is a huge trigger. Like don't ever go for this mythology that you, uh, you should be able to reassist it. No, that's not realistic. The availability is triggering those addictive releases in the brain. Yeah. Purely. I, mean, I, I agree. The environment is critical. I've said, if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. And these yes. people try to coexist with these unhealthy foods. I see them struggle. It's not, it's not reasonable. It's not rational. It's, it's an unreasonable expectation. And it is something that a lot of support circles promote. It is wrong. 
that is not consistent with science, which is you should be able to resist temptation. No, when you have a huge buildup of these addictive craving neurotransmitters in your head, they will control your behavior. Absolutely. This one we could talk a whole show about and we have with other guests, but does growing up in a specific area contribute to one's susceptibility to becoming obese? Well, yes and no, because Nickelodeon took those commercials, the 567 commercials to 65 million households, U.S. households. So you could have lived anywhere in the, New York, in the U.S. and that level of bombardment on a child's brain will create the addiction. It's not something that you control. If they're watching that many commercials, those poor little developing brain cells are becoming addicted. It's Pavlovian conditioning. So that's one piece of it. But the other piece of it is um, there are neighborhoods where the fast food industry has crowded out the family restaurants, the nice little neighborhood restaurants. Nonetheless, nonetheless, you can go into almost any of those convenience stores, somewhere in the back on a bottom shelf will be a package of dried beans. And, you know, maybe it's not the best brand of brown rice, but you can find that. And that is, that's healthy. It's super healthy. So when people say to me, I can't get healthy food. No, you can, uh, but you can't fight through the addiction to get to it. And this is mythology. It's not mythology. I know that there are not fresh foods available in these neighborhoods. Although a lot of convenience stores now will have like two apples in the cooler. They'll have two tomatoes in the cooler. They'll have a carton of eggs in the cooler. So you can get it. And if you think about how people have evolved over 7 million years, that would have been a lot of food to find in one day. Uh, so humans are designed to look for food for about four hours a day and uh, play the rest of the time, which most of us have jobs. We're not playing anymore, but... Uh, it's, it's not the explanation for why. The explanation for why we have obesity is that there, there are these corporations running, you know, the five A's of the addiction business model. Yeah. You know, I understand that affordability is an issue. And that's one of the guests I had on recently, his name was Doug Evans. He wrote a book called The Sprout Book. And for my birthday, I received a sprouting kit and sprouting is really cheap. I mean, you can uh -huh. grow, I mean, and you, it doesn't matter if you live in anywhere, like you can, right. you, people, you can be in a hotel room, you can just get some seeds, which are very inexpensive, add some water in a few days, you have like tons of, of healthy vegetables. FAJ, I love these ideas. I've never heard of that. I've never thought about it, but absolutely. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's incredible because like when I think that I used to buy this little thing of broccoli sprouts at the store for $4 organic, well, $4, I get this huge bag and I can just make a lot of it. And it does A lifetime. <laughs> yeah, and you don't have to have a green thumb, which I don't. And you can be in, it doesn't matter if you're in a con, I mean, it doesn't matter if you have a yard or not because you sprout indoors. Yeah, on your windowsill. Yeah, I, I actually put it in the oven. I mean, I, I'm not, not on heat, but I mean, to be dark and it, it, it comes out fine in two or three days. So anyway, the thing is we got to get people to start liking vegetables because once you've been having your palate adulterated by all that sugar, fat and salt from years of processed food, let's face mm -hmm. it, first vegetables mm -hmm. don't taste as good. Yeah, yeah. That's a brilliant idea. Well, thank you. Yeah, and, and, yeah. They're, yeah, and they're healthy. So there's one more question and I kept this one for, for last because this one I feel I can answer with you because it, it's asking for our experiences. So maybe I will go first on this one. How have your own experiences shaped your view of the American food industry and what do you wish would be different? I'll start with the second part of the question first. What I wish would be different is that, that they just tell the truth. Just like when you buy cigarettes, it says the Surgeon General has determined you know, smoking is hazardous to your health. 
have it on the Coke saying this will make you fat and sick. How fat and sick or how fat or how sick you get, we don't know. But you know what I'm saying is just tell the truth and then have subsidies be more fair. It's just, it's so unfair right now how, you know, a, a cost of McDonald's burger in the real world wouldn't cost what it would if we didn't subsidize all the unhealthy crops talk about. So I just like the information to get out. I just would like it to be more fair. And again, I can't if I can't stop them from selling it, at least, you know, let people know that this is this is a dangerous product and and maybe even have to be a certain age to have it. You know, when you think about it, you know, I personally don't drink. I have strong opinions. I don't on that because I've had two family members that were hit by drunk drivers and they were both mm. doctors. And even mm. though they were broken and bleeding, they had to help the, the, the alcoholic that hit them. I, I don't, I, I, I just don't, I just don't care for alcohol or drinking or being around any of that, but I'm I understand like it's, it's legal. However, there's rules around it. For example, you know, you don't you, like, for example, like even at the store I go to, you can't do self checkout for alcohol, for example. Right. You know, right. And, and you have to be a certain age. So even though, I live in a world that alcohol exists. There are some rules around it. It's a little yeah. harder to get, you know, it's not yeah. like Slurpee where 24 hours you can get it. So I'd like it to be, I'd like, you know, I'd like, you know, people to know and, and especially, and I'd like it not to be so that the schools, you know, like when you go to even like in a middle school, like, you know, you'll go to a football game and you'll see these posters, you know, Domino's pizza, Coke, because they give money to the school. I'd like that to stop. So I'd like a lot of what I'd like to see change. I'd like to see processed food just go away. But I know that it would be like prohibition. People would find a way to make it. But at least, you know, if you make processed food, at least you got a shot that it could be a little bit healthier. Yeah. So really, I'm, I'm an abolitionist when it comes to processed food. I think the best amount is none. Nobody needs it. Even if you're somebody that could ostensibly eat it and not get diabetes and not get fat, it's not food. You're not, you're just kidding yourself. Yeah. So, and, and my own experience was somebody that at a very young age got addicted to it, not knowing it was an addiction, being laughed at because saying, I remember saying to a doctor in my twenties, you know, I think I have a problem with sugar. Oh, that's impossible as he was drinking his tab, you know? Yeah. yeah. And I remember he sent me for something called, uh, because I, you know, when I think about all these problems that I had that were diagnosed as psychiatric, no, because no. The, minute the, the minute the drug was gone, meaning the sugar and the flour and all that stuff, I have no, I don't have psychiatric problems. I had, you know, eat, you know, addictive problems. And, but I remember being sent in my early twenties for something called a glucose tolerance test. It was one of the long ones, like over six hours. And the doctor said to prepare for it for 72 hours, you need to eat like 6,000 calories a day, like cake. And, and it was like, I was like, this is, this is like the best diet ever. I'm this getting this test amazing. all the time. I know. It's like, I love this test. I remember going to Webby's bakery on the corner of Laurel Canyon and Ventura. It's not there anymore in studio city and like ordering like an entire sheet cake. And I'm like, I don't see a yeah, problem here. So, <laughs> so that's my experience with the processed food industry. And now you can tell us yours. Well, I'm going to just um, elaborate on what you just said. When you look at how destructive these substances are, that the U.S. government, the, it's, I think it's the Bureau of Tobacco and Arms or something inside the Department of Justice, it keeps a list of controlled substances. Nicotine is a controlled substance. Alcohol, ethanol is a controlled substance. Um, there are legal controlled substances and then there are illegal controlled substances, cocaine and meth and um, those are illegal controlled substances. Uh, for example, marijuana just moved from the, for many states now from the illegal controlled substances to just the legal controlled substances. But you're absolutely right. They are controlled. You can only buy them in certain circumstances and the people who sell them must ask for ID and they're not advertised. If the advertising for them is also controlled and they do have warning labels. So there, there's a set of laws that apply to controlled substances. And when you think about, um, you know, tobacco does, does contribute to heart disease and obviously cancer, lung disease, emphysema. But you compare that to 141 diseases associated with processed foods, it's, that's what I would change. I would put these highly addictive, destructive substances on the controlled substance list. 
That's fantastic. This has been amazing. If you don't mind, Dr. Flynn, I'd like to ask one question of, of myself, because this is something that I guess I don't explain very well, even though you and I did an interview about this maybe over 10 years ago. But in the programs I teach, which are based on whole foods, we, we eat grains, but whole grains like quinoa, teff, millet, amaranth, you know, that are cooked in water and can, you know, and but I recommend people that have food addictions eat the ones that are gluten free. And they they go, well, I don't understand. You know, the caloric density of you know all the ones with gluten are the same. But you're one of the few people, other than Dr. Owen Linsner, that really explains why. And again, this doesn't have to be everybody, but why some people, if they're sensitive to food addiction, may want to just eat the the gluten free grains. Yeah, because uh, gluten contains a gluteomorphine which has been shown to attach to the opiate receptors in the brain. So everybody thinks the gluten issue is a gut issue. But one scientist did a great study. He um, got a group of people with gut problems and without. He took them off of gluten and he, uh, he just, you know, he collected all this data. But a lot of people just said they felt better. They didn't have the gut issue, but they felt better. So six months goes by, he goes back and he asks them again how they're doing. And uh, a whole group of people with no gut issues are, have permanently given up gluten. They said, well, why? And it was because I feel better. So gluten is a, a mood altering substance. It just, that's what the evidence shows. Now, what I think, uh, what we are teaching, what we're beginning to teach is uh, rotation. So you're, it, we do have a, um, I think it's a, a five or six day uh, plant protein rotation. So on Monday, you always eat beans or lentils. On Tuesday, you eat amaranth for the whole day. On Wednesday, you eat uh, quinoa for the whole day. Thursday is buckwheat for the whole day. And then you begin again. So you will see, oh, and then, uh, then you could do grains. You, like you could do um, like the high protein grains for a fifth day. That is true. You could do that. You will see for yourself uh, how you feel on that fifth day. But you do it in a in that five day rotation again and again and again. And you say, well, the second day of my rotation, I always feel great. And day three, I always feel crummy. Well, you know that quinoa works for you and amaranth does not. So this is, I really want to empower people to figure out what works for them. And you'll see, I know because I took, uh, when I had a prepared meal company, uh, I started learning about gluteomorphines um, uh, Perlmutter's book came out, Grain Brain. And I said to my chef, I said, we're going to have to take barley out of our meals. It was the only grain that we were using that had gluten. And immediately I felt better. So it's, you can decide this for yourself using a rotation method, but gluten is not in my diet. Mm -mm, no right. way. Same here. Thank you so much. You know, yeah. I like to get people like you and Dr. Vera Tarman and Michael Moss and Marion Nessa like all superhero capes because I mean, oh. I just I just wish that we could take these, these the processed food industry down. I mean, they have a class. You, awesome. you are, you are, you are. A a Chef AJ, you are doing it because every time somebody listens to one of your podcasts, uh, they will start to reduce their spending and it the money is power in this particular industry if you stop buying their products just go over to that produce section buy things that look like they still look at the moment of harvest those are unprocessed foods and those cannot hurt you absolutely well thank you so much dr thank Ethel. you this thank you a wonderful conversation and thanks i all. hope i let me know what your high school student uh does with this absolutely you are, we hopefully you, she'll get an a but thank you yeah. so much for helping her and thanks all, right. all of you for watching another episode of chef aj live please come back to not tomorrow, come back tomorrow, but come back in one hour. I have a bonus show today with Dr. Oh. Roger Schwelt. He is a critical care doctor and pulmonary doctor on the front line trenches of COVID. And he'll be talking about things that are really important as well. Oh, Thanks good. again, Dr. Iflin. Take care. Thank you. Bye.